Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Dark Half by Stephen King. It's quite cool, you can see that on the cover there, where it's got The Dark Half written in dark text. So I'm going to give you the blurb. The sparrows are flying again. The idea, unbidden, inexplicable, haunts the edge of Thad Beaumont's mind. Thad should be happy. For years now, it is his secret persona, George Stark, author of super-violent pulp thrillers, who has paid the family bills. But now Thad is writing seriously again under his own name, and his menacing pseudonym has been buried forever. And yet, the sparrows are flying again, and something is terribly wrong in Thad Beaumont's world. The Dark Half, a masterpiece of imagination from the world's best-selling author. And here it says his masterpiece. Now, I mean, it's Stephen King, so he has quite a few masterpieces. I don't know if you could put this above, say, The Stand. However, I did really enjoy this book. I think it's probably King's best novel about a writer main character. And my reason for that is that in a lot of the others, it just sort of feels incidental that the writer's a character. Like, even with uh, The Shining, for example, I mean, the ca that character could easily, Jack Torrance, could easily have just been a teacher. Uh, and so it just quite often feels as though, like, this writer character is just crowbarred in. Uh, the same with uh, Bag of Bones when I read that recently. It was just like, oh no, not another writer main character. Whereas in this one, the same with Misery, I suppose, that the story happens because the writer is a character. And interestingly, I suppose, both this and Misery are both inspired by King's own career as a writer. So in Misery, it was uh, the outcry he got after writing The, Eyes of the Eye of the Dragon. Uh, he realised that fans could be assholes, basically, and then created this crazed super fan in the, in the form of Annie Wilkes. And here, the dark half is very much King's experiences with Richard Bachman, his pseudonym, uh, and also he killed off Richard Bachman. He gives him, uh, he gave him cancer of the pseudonym, and so it's interesting that there's that parallel between Stephen King killing off Bachman and then Thad Beaumont killing off George Stark. It's also cool how they both feel like very different characters despite the fact that they're also the same character and kind of the gimmick that was used to bring the two of them together as well to like make the two of them interrelated. So uh, yeah, all in all I thought there were a lot of really interesting ideas in this. So I'm gonna go through and start checking out some of my little flags. So this is where spoilers begin for those who uh, for those who care. I'm gonna start by pointing right at the beginning, author's note here. I'm indebted to the late Richard Bachman for his help and inspiration. This novel could not have been written without him. So I thought that was quite interesting. And also I think his secret that he was Bachman kind of came out in a similar way to how uh, Thad Beaumont's secret of George Stark came out in this one. And how we actually start is uh, with with Stark... Uh, and how we actually start is with Bowman and his wife kind of staging this photo shoot where they bury George Stark. And it's, you know, a fake gravestone and whatnot. But they do this photo shoot in this graveyard and they're, they're doing this interview piece. And then throughout we kind of get nods back to this interview piece and bits where they maybe didn't quite tell the truth. King kind of describes it as how writers have this own fiction. They tell them about their lives, about their own lives, and they're not lying. It's just how you amp up the inherent story in any true event, you know? So here we have the first little hint that George Stark might be around. And this is with uh, Digger Holt. He's the, uh, the cemetery, the graveyard man. And it's said that like all small towns have a digger hole. And also he's, I, th I think he's only part time in the cemetery. So he does other things like digging up roads and stuff, if, if I recall correctly. And it's really annoying for him because his job digging graves is only like 10% of the work he does. But of course he still gets the nickname digger. And it was here, right where this stupid goddamn hole was, that they had planted that fake grave marker. Why, if he needed any further proof, there were still marks in the sod. Marks which had been left there by that high-class cunt's heels. She'd been from New York, all right. Only a New York woman would show up in high heels at the end of slop season and then goose-step around a cemetery in them, taking pictures. If that wasn't... His thoughts broke off and that feeling of coldness reasserted itself in his flesh again. He had been looking at the fading tattoos left by the photographer's high heels, and as he looked at those marks, his eyes happened on other, fresher marks. Apologies for my bad language there, I didn't know that was coming, but... <laughs> I'm going to read out this bit here as well, Death in a Small Town. And by the way, that small town would be Castle Rock, Maine. 
Small town murder and real life, he had found, rarely bore any likeness to the small town murders in Agatha Christie novels, where seven people all took a turn at stabbing wicked old Colonel Storping Goiter at his country house in Puddleby on the Marsh during a moody winter storm. In real life, Pangborn knew, you almost always arrived to find the perp still standing there, looking down at the mess and wondering what the fuck he'd done, how it all jittered out of control with such lethal speed. Even if the perp had strolled off, he usually hadn't gone far, and there were two or three eyewitnesses who could tell you exactly what had happened, who had done it, and where he had gone. The answer to the last question was usually the nearest bar. As a rule, small town murder in real life was simple, brutal, and stupid. And I just like that little nod to Agatha Christie, there's another one later as well. And I think it's like affectionate teasing of her, you know? And then we get the moment where, in a crime that Thad Beaumont couldn't possibly have done, his fingerprints are found behind the wheel of a car. And that's when we start to see some of the similarities between him and George Stark. It's actually interesting because he's tried to kill George Stark three times. So Stark, basically Thad's embryo tried to consume Stark's embryo in the, room, in the womb. Then... It, uh, Stark kind of came back as a tumour that was removed when Thad was a kid and then this is his third time of trying to kill Stark after he himself accidentally brought him to life, you know? I like this little bit as well, I think uh, booktubers out there will agree with me when you get like bookish terms used, so, uh, so, uh, so we have Thad's own backlist, all two books of it, Thad put in with a smile, and the new book when it finally comes out. Pardon me, what, what's a backlist? Alan asked. Grinning now, Thad said, the old books they no longer put in the big fancy dump bins at the front of the chain bookstores. So there you go, there's your official Stephen King definition of what backlist means. Then we have a phrase written in the victim's blood at one of the apartments, and it is, the sparrows are flying again. But it's interesting because Stark himself can't see the, the sparrows. We also have like cool little bits, we get these every now and then in Stephen King, where the formatting of the book you know, play, you know, plays around with it a little bit, and this is because he's almost doing, Thad, Thad is almost doing automatic writing, and it's kind of connecting with Stark's brain in a way. We have a moment where Stark kills somebody, and I just want to read this little paragraph here, because I think it's actually quite, quite telling, but also it's, you know, grim and brutal, which is very Stephen King. So, Stark grabbed her by her hair again, bent her head back until she was staring at the ceiling, shrieking at the ceiling, and cut her throat. The room fell silent. There, sis, he said tenderly. He folded the straight razor back into its handle and put it into his pocket. Then he reached out his bloody left hand and closed her eyes. The cuff of his shirt was immediately soaked in warm blood because her jugular was still pumping the claret, but the proper thing to do was the proper thing to do. When it was a woman, you closed her eyes. It didn't matter how bad she had been. It didn't matter if she was a junkie whore who had sold her own kids to buy dope. You closed her eyes. There's also a moment where uh, Stark poses as a blind man. And there are quite a lot of blind people and deaf people as well in like the Stephen King universe, I suppose. I just think it must be something that fascinates King as a writer because he kind of comes back to it quite a lot. We have the end of part one here as well where the police are putting in a wiretap. And um, I, I want to read this aloud here. So, uh, don't do that, one of the cops shouted suddenly and sprang forward. Do what? Rick began, turning his key and the door exploded in a flash of light and smoke and sound. The cop, whose instincts had triggered just an instant too late, was recognisable to his relatives. Rick Cowley was nearly vaporised. The other cop, who had been standing a little farther back and who had instinctively shielded his face when his partner cried out, was treated for burns, concussion and internal injuries. Mercifully, almost magically, the shrapnel from the door on the wall flew around him in a cloud but never touched him. He would never work for the NYPD again, however. The blast struck him stone deaf in an instant. Inside Rick's apartment, the two technicians from communications who had come to cook the phones lay dead on the living room rug. Tacked to the forehead of one with a pushpin was this note. The sparrows are flying again. Tacked to the forehead of the other was a second message. More fool stuffing. Tell Thad. And then we go into part two of Stark Takes Charge. He's a great villain. Especially because he has this kind of... He has his foot in our world and his foot in you know, the spiritual or whatever you want to call it. He's like half ghost, half real. The police then get a recording of George and Thad talking to each other as well, and they have the same voice print. And obviously this all comes back to, it's because they were the same sort of thing, especially in the womb when uh, Thad absorbed, uh, absorbed Stark. We've got a quote here from when uh, 
Thad, Thad's novel, his work in progress is on hold. It says, it was very hard to make up stories when you were afraid a bad man, a very bad man, was going to show up and slaughter your whole family before starting in on you. I like this uh, discussion. So they have twin kids themselves as well. And uh, here we have a little bit about the twins. Wendy's sobs were winding down to sniffles. Accordingly, William also began to dry up. He reached out a chubby arm and snatched at his sister's white cotton t-shirt. She looked around. He cooed, then babbled at her. To Thad, their babbling always sounded a little eerie, like a foreign language which had been speeded up just enough so you couldn't quite tell which one it was, let alone understand it. Wendy smiled at her brother, although her eyes were still streaming tears and her cheeks were wet with them. She cooed and babbled in reply. For a moment, it was as if they were holding a conversation in their own private world, the world of twins. And this is kind of like a recurring theme throughout. Here's the bit where the pencil goes through his hand, so uh, I'm going to read this, this little bit out. Suddenly his arm flew up. At the same time, his numb hand flicked the pencil with the agility of a stage magician manipulating a card, and instead of holding it between his fingers most of the way down its barrel, he was gripping the pencil in his fist like a dagger. He brought it down, Stark brought it down, and suddenly the pencil was buried in the web of flesh between the thumb and first finger of his left hand. The graphite tip, somewhat dulled by the writing Stark had done with it, passed almost all the way through it. The pencil snapped. A bright puddle of blood filled the depression the pencil's barrel had dragged into his flesh, and suddenly the force which had gripped him was gone. Red pain raved up from his hand, which lay on his desk with the pencil jutting out of it. Thad threw his head back and clamped his teeth shut against the agonised howl which fought to escape his throat. But he treats himself rather than going to the hospital because he knows A, the police aren't going to believe him, and he doesn't want to worry his wife as well. I also like this little bit about when he goes to bed after that, and he goes to lie down with his wife. Liz did not wake when he lay down beside her. Some time later, he escaped into three hours of grainy, fitful sleep in which nightmares flew and circled around him, always just out of reach. And I think that's nice because that imagery there ties back to, you know, the, the sparrows flying again. I like as well, so Stark needs Thad, because Stark needs Thad to write a new novel under the Stark pseudonym. And basically that'll transfer, almost transfer the lifeblood between them. So it'll keep Stark alive and kill off Thad Beaumont. And uh, if Stark tries to write by himself, all he can write is George Stark. So he tries to write the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And it says only when he looked up at the paper, he saw that what he had written was the George George Stark, George Stark over the Starky Stark. And that happens at a later time as well, except he starts to write uh, the sparrows, uh, you know, whatever it was, the sparrows are flying again. And uh, we have this bit here with uh, Alan Pangborn. He's the sheriff of Castle Rock. And I just like this little paragraph here that kind of describes some of the work he's been doing. There had been a gaudy forecast smash-up on Route 117 five days ago, a booze-inspired wreck that had left two people dead. Two days later, Norton Briggs had hit his wife with a frying pan, knocking her flat on the kitchen floor. Norton had hit his wife a great many licks during the turbulent 20 years of their marriage, but this time he apparently believed he had killed her. He wrote a short note, long on remorse and short on grammar, then took his own life with a 38 revolver. When his wife, no Rhodes Scholar herself, woke up and found the cooling corpse of her tormentor lying beside her, she had turned on the gas oven and stuck her head into it. The paramedics from rescue services in Oxford had saved her. Barely. And I like how it feels with King when you have like little paragraphs like that. Like Those could be whole novels in themselves, you know? The people feel like they have, even when it's just a backdrop, they have like real lives. And everyone has a story behind them. I like that we have the character Rawley de Lesseps as well, who's like a, a lecturer who works with Thad. And it says he has uh, uh, his room, his, his like uh, office at the university or whatever, is dominated by a dartboard with a photograph of Ronald Reagan mounted on it. Which I think says a lot about the character and also says a lot about the time in which this was written and in which it was set. I'm going to read this lovely little paragraph as well. Stark sliced upwards, splitting the crotch of Eddings's beige trooper uniform, splitting his scrotal sack, drawing the razor up and out in a long, buttery stroke. Eddings's balls, suddenly untethered from each other, swung back against his inner thighs like heavy knots on the end of an unravelling sash cord. Blood stained his pants around the zipper. For a moment, he felt as if someone had jammed a handful of ice cream into his groin. And then the pain struck, hot and full of ragged teeth. He screamed. King's just so right, good at writing these, like, really visceral scenes you know also i think it's kind of sinister that basically there's a confrontation between stark and beaumont's wife and the two twins 
And the twins kind of see him just as like their daddy. They can't tell the difference between the two of them almost. Then Thad as well to try and confront George. He has to lose this like police protection escort he's got. And so kind of goes on the run. So we have this interesting quandary where he's like trying to speed to get there as fast as possible without being stopped by a policeman because that would be the end of it all. I like here as well where like Thad Beaumont and George Stark are kind of sitting down together to write a book. And it says, um, Stark lit a pal man himself, picked up one of his barrels, opened his own notebook and then paused. He looked at Thad with naked honesty. I'm scared, Hoss, he said. And Thad felt a great wave of sympathy for Stark in spite of everything he knew. Scared? Yes, of course you are, he thought. Only the ones just starting out. The kids aren't scared. The years go by and the words on the page don't get any darker, but the white space sure does get whiter. Scared? You'd be crazier than you are if you weren't. And then finally at the end, after the big confrontation, the policeman just says, yeah, let's just, let's just burn the house. Because otherwise they're going to have to try and explain what happened or that, you know, the police are going to be stuck with figuring it out. And it'd just be better for everyone if the house was burned down. So he kind of basically gets on board with a little bit of arson there. So yeah, th those are a few of my highlights of The Dark Half by Stephen King. I think it's very much a must read if you're a serious King fan. Might not be the best one to start with, but definitely actually I would say try and read some Richard Bachman and kind of familiarise yourself with who King is and who Bachman is and how they interrelate and all this stuff before reading The Dark Half because I think that will, you know, add some, add some weight to it. And I'm actually quite glad this is probably like my... 30th at least probably probably even like 40th Stephen King book now so um, it's I'm glad I saved it but also I'm very glad I read it I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 so there we have it that's what I thought of The Dark Half by Stephen King don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so what you thought of it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye